All right. I've, I've gotten to spend quite a bit of time on this passage, and I'm very excited to share it with you. Um, I want to talk today about holding on. Okay? Holding on. Um, it's gonna, we're going to be looking at about uh, God's holding on to us and then our holding on to God and some very important things. They're both found in this passage. In Colossians chapter 1, which is where we'll be, um, I think I've read Colossians many, 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 many times in the last few weeks, the whole thing, and you know, you, you think you know it, and then you find more. And, but in uh, Colossians chapter 1, the first two verses, uh, this gives you the setting. Uh, Paul was writing this letter to a church in the city of Colossae. And uh, so the first two verses say, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. And that's because he was writing from prison. He was writing from Rome. It was not his final imprisonment, probably, but he was imprisoned in Rome under house arrest. You can find that in Acts chapter 28. Uh, so Timothy was there. And then um, it says, to the saints, to the saints. Imagine Paul was writing a letter which was going to go 1,200 miles to the saints in Colossae in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, uh, to the to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. And so, just remember, he was writing this letter to this church. It was very important to him. And we know a little bit more, if you'll turn to the chapter 4 of Colossians, and uh, it was intended not only for the church at Colossae, but it was also intended for the church at Laodicea and probably Heropolis and probably other churches in that area. And so in Colossians 4, for example, verse 14, uh, Paul concludes this letter by saying, Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings. So Luke was with him in Rome and... Um, and also Demas, and then greet the brethren who are at Laodicea, which is close to there in that same region, and Hiram, and, and also Nympha and the church that is in her house. When this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans. And you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. So you can tell that Paul was in prison concerned for the churches of Asia Minor. And he had great reason to be concerned. Um, and so he was uh, intending the church at Colossae and Laodicea to hear his words. They were the the words of an apostle, the words of a church planter, the words of one who had given his life for the sake of the church. And so um, he was concerned for the churches of Asia Minor. And we know that he had been there. Acts chapter 13, he was sent out by the Holy Spirit, by the church, and he had turned to the Gentiles. He began preaching to them, and, uh, and he made his first God made God's first convert in Philippi, uh, and in Europe. And uh, then uh, after being imprisoned with Silas, he went on to Thessalonica and to Athens and to Corinth. And eventually he ended up on his third missionary journey. He was at a place called Ephesus. And he stayed in Ephesus for at least two years, teaching and discipling and uh, 
helping the church become strong. And, and then uh, in Acts chapter 19, uh, I'm going to have you write, just, I'll read it. You can just jot it down. Acts chapter 19. Um, boy, I can't turn that fast. Um, verse 10. It says, This took place for two years, so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So while Paul was in Ephesus, Luke wrote down that all, all the world, all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord. I'm not sure that that was every single person, but it meant that throughout Asia, the word of God was heard as Paul communicated, as Paul taught, as he made disciples. And out of that, I believe, which was a hundred miles away, a man named Epaphras traveled to the city of Colossae. And he, that was where he was from. He was from Colossae. And that's where he would have heard the gospel and traveled back to Colossae uh, to, to uh, plant that church. And uh, so it's a pretty amazing thing that happens there. The word, of law, the word of the Lord was being heard in all of Asia. And uh, then later, later, Paul found himself in prison for his faith in Rome. And Epaphras had brought to him an update on what was going on in the church of Colossae. And so the result of that report from Epaphras... The result was, Paul, look at Paul's response. This is the response of someone who cares deeply about the church, the well-being of the church, the, well, the future of the church, the ministry of the church. This is someone who was deeply, deeply invested in the churches of Asia Minor. And so he says in chapter 1, verse 3, um, we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you. The word of truth, the gospel came to you. Um, just as in all the world, also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras. Our beloved fellow bond servant, which means fellow slave of Christ, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. And he also informed us of your love in the spirit. So here was this apostle in prison in Rome, getting a report about the church in Colossae and falling on his knees and praying and saying in this letter that he prays continually for them. And uh, he's also commending Epaphras because it says that he, you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bond servant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. So the church was founded by a faithful man a faithful bond servant of Christ. And that's very important as we begin this uh, epistle, this letter. So today we just want to look at chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. That's really all. Uh, so we're going to kind of jump ahead a little bit in chapter 1. So 
there are three things that we will discover today. The first one is that there was a huge problem. There was a huge problem. Secondly, there was a tremendous blessing. And then thirdly, there was a great responsibility. Okay? And we are looking at the church at Colossae, but we're looking at the church in Winlock as well. We're looking at us this morning as well. Believers in Christ right here. So a huge problem, first of all, in chapter 1, verse 21. Here it is. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. <laughs> that is me. And that's you. And that was the Colossian believers before the gospel came to them. Uh, Paul just simply says that you were formerly um, alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds. So, um, I'm just telling you, I don't, I've been to the hospital a few times to look at little babies that have been born. You ever done that? <laughs> Quite a few of us have done that. And, uh, you know, we go to the maternity ward, and you look through the glass and stare down at this little life, this little baby, and usually they look so cute and so soft and cuddly and, you know, usually. <laughs> Sometimes you have to say, yep, that's a baby. Uh, <laughs> that's all you can say. But that little baby sitting in there, you know, looks so innocent. And so sometimes we think that human beings are born innocent. And we're born with this clean slate. And, you know, it's something else happens along the way uh, to that little baby. <laughs> And sometimes it doesn't take long to discover that there's a sin nature in there somewhere. <laughs> there is selfishness in there. And I think babies, I've watched, because we have a little grandson who's still pretty small, and, you know, they're, they're pretty good at making their will known. And, you know, if their diaper is dirty, or if they're hungry, or, I mean, Alicia's little boy, Elias, when he's tired, he cries until you put him to bed. That's an amazing thing. <laughs> but anyway, I think God builds in a, a, a mechanism in us that needs to be self-centered. It needs to be focused on me. We have birds in our backyard, some flickers that come out there. And just lately, the flickers will, you know, come to the bird feeder out there and they start yelling. And they say, feed me. They don't say it in English, but they say, feed me, feed me, feed me, you know. And pretty soon the mom eats some suet, gets it in her mouth, and starts feeding those flickers. And we can have five or six of them out there at a time. So they begin to say, I have needs. I need something. Uh, and that's not wrong. That's not bad. That's survival. If mom didn't do it, they would probably all die. Um, so, but there is in every one of us a, a, a problem called sin. And I believe that the Bible teaches clearly that we were born with a sin nature. We inherited Adam's, the, the, the sin of Adam was imputed to us. We were born with a the propensity, the, the urge to sin. We don't have to be taught. We don't have to go to school and have the, the chart pulled down that teaches our kids how to sin. Do we? Do we? No. Not at all. I mean, we know how to sin. We, we just, it's from within. It's called the sin nature. And it's a huge problem. Um, each one of us, according to this passage, is born separated from God. You're born that way. I was born that way. My mom and dad did a great job of raising us and loving us, but I was born with a nature 
that wanted to sin. And so were you. Each one of us is born separated from God and in desperate need of God's saving power and work in our lives. Um, we were all separated. Um, we're separated, first of all, in our minds. Our minds are separated. Listen to this. Um, uh, Ephesians 2.12 says, Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That doesn't sound very encouraging, right? That was uh, excluded, without hope, without God. That's literally how a baby is born into the world. And I love babies. I mean, and they're precious usually for a while. And, you know, uh, Ephesians 4, 17 and 18 says, so, so this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God. That's a pretty big indictment. You're a Gentile. You're excluded from the life. You're not in. We're not born in the club. We're not born fit for heaven. We are born as rebels. We are born as sinners. Every one of you. And me too. Before conversion, the Colossian believers were enemies. This is, this is the, the language here. Enemies or hostile to God in their minds. Hostility to God begins right here. Um, they were literally cut off. They were literally estranged. And all of us were born in, the same, in that same boat. So our minds are hostile to God and our deeds are offensive to God. Now, maybe you think I've been in the church so long, I don't do anything that's offensive to God anymore. I've got it all figured out, right? <laughs> I don't think so. So our minds are hostile to God. Our deeds are offensive to God. Um, so uh, sin always begins in the heart. It begins in the mind. It begins in, inside of us. Um, Jesus taught, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So whatever actions come out, it's something that begins in the heart. Sin manifests itself in evil deeds like Galatians chapter 5 tells us. The deeds of the flesh are evident. Galatians 5, 19 through 20. So people sin against God outwardly because they are hostile inwardly. They are estranged from God in, in, inwardly. And they need to be born again. They need to be reborn. Sinners need to be born again by the power of God. Sin ruins or continues to ruin our relationship with God. So we have a huge problem, but in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 22, we talk about a tremendous blessing, a tremendous blessing that we should take to the bank, we should think about it, we should give thanks to God for it every day. It's a tremendous blessing, and that is that God has intervened to repair our damaged relationship with him. God has intervened in our lives so that that relationship with God that is broken can be repaired. Look at chapter 1, verse 22. It says, Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him 
holy and blameless and beyond reproach. That is amazing. For all the ways that human beings mess up and go our own way and offend God and live our lives in a way that is uh, offensive to Him, God in His mercy through the death of Christ repairs our broken and damaged relationship with God. And uh, with, the, with the view or with the goal at the end of presenting you before God, holy and blameless and above reproach. Wow, that's a huge, huge change, isn't it? One day, every true believer in Christ will be presented without sin to God. And that's what Paul was reminding. Paul was writing to the Colossian believers and said, you used to be alienated from God, separated from God, without hope. But Christ, and that was the message that Epaphras brought, is that Christ uh, died for sins and that he came to repair the broken relationship between you Colossians and a holy God. That's what he did. And he was trying to tell them that's a tremendous blessing. God has intervened and has done something about our sin problem. Sean McDowell uh, says over and over, the uniqueness of Christ is that he came to fix our problem of sin. That's the, that's the gospel. He came to fix our sin problem. And how did he accomplish this? Christ died and shed his blood in order to satisfy the righteous demands of God against sinners. His death was a substitutionary sacrifice. You know, if you read uh, not only Colossians, but also 1 John, uh, you're going to hear about something that was growing in the early church time. It was called Gnosticism. And the Gnostics uh, denied the true humanity of Christ. But I'm going to tell you, in order, God did not die. God never died. But in his humanity, Christ died completely on the cross. And uh, that's why John wrote, by this you know the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. You had to have a human sacrifice to atone for sin. You had to. And so that's where we get that. Uh, Hebrews 9.22 says, and according to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. If Christ had not come in the flesh, there would never have been a sacrifice for your sin, ever. Um, therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. So anyway, we could talk about that more, but that's going on here. When Paul hears about what's going on in Colossae and the other churches, he's starting to hear about the infiltration of false teaching, a false doctrine, the infiltration about really difficult things. But I think what, what Paul is writing about here in verse 22 is um, he, and yet he, has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. There are many Bible passages that tell us that God is holding every true believer tightly. There's never a day in, that I can remember in my life as a Christian when I've ever gone to bed and worried about whether God was holding on to me. Never. And I believe there's plenty of scriptures that talk about how God 
holds on to us. And I'm going to do this kind of quickly, okay? Just take a deep breath and just let me indulge me for a minute. But here's the reason why I never worry about God letting go of me. Never losing his grip on my life individually, okay? Here it is. Number one, there is the unconditional promise of a sovereign God. Okay? He said, I assure you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. That's John 5.24. Isn't that great? Man, that thing is full of promises. The unconditional promise of our sovereign God. Is that good? Yeah. Okay, just seeing if you're awake. Number two, there is the unchangeable will of God. There is God's will. It is what God wants, and it's unchangeable. Listen to this, Romans 8, 29 through 30. It says, For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn of many brothers. And those he predestined, he called. And those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. That is the will of God for every individual believer to take them from justification to glorification in heaven. And so there is the unconditional promise of a sovereign God. There is the unchangeable will of God. Thirdly, there is the infinite power of God. I don't have power to keep myself. I don't have power to keep myself in the faith. But God has infinite power. And that assures us that he is able to save and keep us eternally. John 10, 29 says, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able, what? To snatch them out of the Father's hand. No one is able to do that. Uh, Romans 4, 21 says, Because he was fully convinced that he what he had promised, he also was able to perform. And then our benediction, June 24. We've, we've been saying it lately a while. It says, now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless and with great joy. That just says God is able. Say it with me. God is able. God is able. God's infinite power. Excuse me. And then the last one that I have here, actually the second to the last one, is God's infinite love. Um, God's infinite love reveals his eternal purpose and the fact that his eternal purpose will be fulfilled. John 10, 28 through 29 says, I give them eternal life and they will never, what? I give them eternal life and they will never perish. Ever. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And Romans 5, uh, 7 through 11, and I don't have time to read the whole thing this morning, okay? And then the last one is that God's pure righteousness. Sometimes people question that a person could be saved, that a person could deserve to be saved, could deserve to go to heaven, and sometimes they charge God with leniency, like... Well, how can God forgive that person for all that he did or she did? How in the world could that happen? Well, the Bible teaches us that God is pure in righteousness and his justice is pure. And there is nothing 
impure in the justice of God. So it says, this is because the demands of God's righteousness have been completely met by the death of Christ. In that he died for the sins of the whole world. God is not saving sinners on the ground of leniency. He is perfectly righteous in forgiving sin, not only for those who live before the cross of Christ, but for all who live after the cross of Christ. God is, God is not lenient. His forgiveness, His, his uh, saving anyone is based on the completed, finished, sufficient work of Christ on the cross. Amen? All right, so there was a huge problem. There was a tremendous blessing. And finally, there is great responsibility. Great responsibility on your part and my part. And I think as Paul wrote to the Colossians, he was telling them of their responsibility as well. He was giving them instructions. So in verse 23, it says... If indeed you continue in the faith. Mm -hmm. Wow. That sounds almost the opposite of what we've just read, right? Um, if indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. So at a glance, I'm going to just read this if you don't mind. At a glance, this conditional phrase seems to suggest that if they failed to continue steadfastly in faith and hope, then they would lose their salvation and forfeit their reconciliation with God once again, becoming alienated and hostile toward the one who had redeemed them. So that would mean that um, salvation is ultimately based on our own faithfulness. Is that true? Is that true? Yes. Is your security in Christ uh, dependent upon your faithfulness? Faithfulness? Pardon? Not mine, but his. But whose? But Oh, yeah. Yeah. But here, I, wanted to, I want you to understand something about this text. Um, we look at the text as Westerners, as Americans. Americans are independent. You know, we like to do our own thing. We want to live our own lives. We want to follow Christ in our own way, in our own time. And so when we, we read this passage, we read in chapter 1, verse 23, if indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast. You know, and... In English, it makes perfectly perfect sense. So I'm reading my Bible, and I read that, and I come to the conclusion, I better be firmly established in my faith, my individual faith, and I better be steadfast, and I better not be moved away from the hope of the gospel. And it's all about me. It's my interpretation of that phrase which is partly true, but if you read and you understand the language that it was written in, I'm going to tell you it's, it has a Texas flavor. <laughs> it really does. What Paul wrote to the believers at Colossae was, if indeed you all continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you all 
have heard. And that's really what the language teaches there. And so there are implications for me individually, but I think he was teaching a church as he was 100, uh, 1,200 miles away, writing to them, concerned with their testimony, with their uh, witness among the people of Asia Minor. He was concerned with them as a church, as a ministry. And I think that the Bible is pretty clear that churches can drift away. Denominations can drift away from the truth. Um, so what I'm trying to say here is that we can drift away from the truth. And so that's one of the reasons why in chapter 1, verse 15, Paul had to say something really clearly to the church at Colossae because this was under attack. This doctrine was being clearly uh, um, rejected or, or, or challenged. In chapter 1, verse 15, it says, For he, Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created. All things were created by him. He is not secondary under some great being. He is the creator. He is, he is elevated over everything, um, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones and dominions. All things have been created through him and for him. That's Christ. That's the deity of Christ. That is the power of Christ. He's not a secondary created being. And, and Paul was writing to the church to make sure they understood that that is extremely important. And if you look out on our landscape today and you look at cults, you look at what they teach about Jesus and that will tell you everything you need to know about where they stand. And so Paul was making this really clear in 1 through 15 through 20. And uh, so, what are we supposed to do? I've got three things that we must do as a church, as a church. And I, before I even say this, I want you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 22 because the stakes are huge. The stakes in this are huge. Revelation 2. And we'll look at the church at Ephesus, chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church at Ephesus write. Now this is to the angel of not one guy in the church or one woman in the church, but to the church, the gathered believers in Ephesus, he wrote. The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand. The one who walks among the seven golden lampstand says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them to be false and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary, but I have this against you. I have this against you, Ephesus Church, First Baptist Church of Ephesus. Um, you have left your first love. Now, we can talk a lot about that. There was an issue of their allegiance, their love, for Christ, and but then he goes on to teach. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds, do the deeds that you did at first or else. Here it is. It isn't like, or else you are going to hell. It isn't, or else you will lose your salvation. It's not, or else that. What is it? What does it say? Or else 
I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. What's a lampstand? A lamp. And he's talking about a church. He's talking about a group of believers in Ephesus. And he's saying, if you don't repent, I'm going to take the lampstand away from you. And you will no longer be a witness for me. You will not be a light in a dark world. What does that say about you and me? I think it says that a church can exist. A church can exist. But it can also die. God can take the lampstand away from a church if a church will not take its responsibility. We're talking about responsibility. We're talking about faithfulness. We're talking about investing our lives in the work that God has for us as a church. And, and it's really easy to play church and coast along and play the game. And God calls the church to, to repent and do the deeds that they did at first or else I will remove their lampstand from them. And I'm telling you, you can go, right, Fred and Donna, you can go to Ephesus today and you can go to Colossae and Pergamum and Thyatira and all those cities and what do you find there? Nothing. Ruins. Ruins. You know, trips for Christians to take to see what it used to be like. <laughs> I don't know. You know? But... Let me, let me give you three things here that we need to do. We, things that we must hold on to tightly. Okay? The first thing that we need to hold on to tightly is this book. This book. We must hold on tightly to the Word of God. I want to read you a story <clears throat> because I believe that the Word of God is uh, extremely important in the life and the witness and the lampstand of a church. And that is, um, I'm going to read that in just a second, but here's a great book if you want, if you have any doubts about how we got the Bible and whether the Bible can be trusted. And, and I think it's kind of an apologetic book, but it's really good. It's called From God to Us how we got our Bible. If you don't know that, it might be good reading for you to, you know, strengthen your confidence in the Word of God. I don't know. But here's what I read. It's called The Anvil That Has Worn Out Many Hammers. <laughs> uh, 19th century writer H.L. Hastings once forcibly interest, illustrated the unique way in which the Bible has withstood the attacks of skepticism. Infidels of 1,800 years have been refuting and overthrowing this book, yet it stands today as solid rock. Its circulation increases, and it is more loved and cherished and read today than ever before. Infidels, with all their assaults, make as much impression on this book as a man with a tack hammer would on the pyramids of Egypt. When the French monarch proposed the persecution of Christians in his dominion, an old statesman and warrior said, Sire, the church of God is an anvil that has worn out many hammers. So the hammers of infidels have been pe pecking away at this book for ages, but the hammers are worn out and the anvil still endures. If this book has, sorry, uh, if this book had not been the book of God, men would have destroyed it long ago. Emperors and popes, kings and priests, princes and rulers have all tried their hand at it. They die and the book still lives. No other book has been so chopped, knived, 
sifted, scrutinized, and vilified what book on philosophy or religion or psychology or Bell's letters of classical or modern time, times has been subject to such a mass attack as the Bible with such venom and skepticism. In fact, some of you know the story about Voltaire, don't you? Voltaire wanted to destroy the Bible and, and he attacked the Bible like no other skeptic, no other unbeliever. And uh, yet, I think it was on his printing press, wasn't it, that the Bible was eventually printed on Voltaire's printing press. So there's another story about a man named Timothy Dwight. He was the grandson of uh, Jonathan Edwards. And I have the story here, but our time is leaving us quickly. So he was the oldest son of Jonathan Edwards' daughter. And he became the president of Yale in 1795. And what was going on right then was there was sort of like this influence from Europe, from France. And there were all the skeptics of France during the Enlightenment, and somehow it had crossed the Atlantic Ocean and the, the uh, university, Yale University uh, was incredibly liberal and under attack and there were clubs um, that were uh, they would get together to belittle the Bible and scoff at the scriptures and they would um, if you read the story of Timothy Dwight it's pretty amazing but Timothy Dwight told his student body because he became the president of Yale University and he became they uh, he invited the student body, these skeptical uh, students, to, uh, he would speak at chapel on any subject that they wanted to. And so they, they wanted him to preach on the Bible. <laughs> so every time he would speak to the student body at Yale for, in chapel, he would just hammer away at the authority, the inspiration, the uh, uh, um, dependability, the, the majesty of the Word of God. And as he kept laying and laying and laying that foundation, um, the school experienced revival. Mm -hmm. And you read the story about Timothy Dwight, you can do that. So God calls us as a church and as individual believers to hold on tightly to the Bible. Um, secondly, we need to hold on tightly to Christ, the Christ of the Bible. And again, I've, all, I've already said, when a cult comes knocking at your door and you ask the question, who is Jesus? Who do you teach? Who do you say Jesus is? Is he a created being? Is he uh, a spirit brother to Lucifer? Is he... Uh, he was a great man. Uh, if, if, when you miss who Christ is, you miss so much. So we have to hold on tightly to Christ. Um, and I think our time is, yeah. So uh, the third thing is we need to hold on to the true gospel. We need to teach the word of God, teach the gospel. Preach the gospel wherever we go. That's number three. Um, when, when the Apostle Paul was about to be beheaded for his faith, the last thing that he wrote to young Timothy, and he said, I solemnly charge you, Timothy, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Timothy, Kerugma, herald the word of God. Never stop. I mean, these are Paul's final words to Timothy that he wrote. To preach the word, preach the word, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. That means always be ready 
to reprove, to rebuke, to exhort with great patience and instruction for the time will come. The time is here. Let's not say it'll be sometime in the future. The time is here right now in this world, in this country, in this county. The time is here when they will not endure what? <laughs> Sound doctrine. They will not like to hear about hell. They will not like to hear. They, they will like to say, everybody's going to be in. Everybody's going to heaven someday. Universalism is going to be one of the mantras of this day. There's no us and them. We're all going to be there in heaven someday. So it says, be ready in season out, reprove, rebuke, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled. They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own devices. And so if... If Paul, and Paul was already dealing with that in Colossae back then. He was already dealing with the pulling away from the truth and the, the Gnostic heresy that was beginning to formulate there and the, the, the attacks against the church. And Paul was on his knees. Paul was a shepherd. He had invested so much in the church there. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, Timothy, be sober in all things, endure hardship, and do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. Fulfill your ministry. I think that's what God would say to this church. What do you want? What do I want? I can't tell you how deeply I want this place to be a bright light for the truth. And I am willing to die fighting for that. I am. I'm willing to die fighting for that, and I will. Um, but I think that it's so easy to go like this with our shoulder thinking someone else should do it. And God calls us to stand up and um, fight the good fight of faith. It's not someone else. It's you and me. Father, thank you for this time. Um, Lord, I know that we're busy and active and involved in so many things, Lord, but I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would hold on to the Word of God, that we would hold on to Christ, and that we would hold on to the truth of the Gospel, and that we would never uh, water it down or drift away or be moved away by some other force. But Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus for this church that we would be a bright, shining light for the truth. We're not the only church. <laughs> We're not the only ones, God. And I pray that many, many churches would be bright and shining and faithful to the truth of the Word of God. I pray that many, many pastors and churches would rise up to be faithful men of God in the pulpits. And I pray that we would teach truth in Awana, we would teach truth in women's Bible studies, that we would teach truth in our homes, that we would be faithful to the Word of God. Um, but I pray that for here. I pray that for here. And I'm committed to praying and praying until we see the, the light becoming more bright and more vibrant pray that you would show us your glory, Jesus. 
pray in Christ's name. Amen.